Hey everyone, welcome to the LinkedIn Presents Redefining Work podcast. I am your host, Lars Schmidt, and today I am joined by Kelly Scheib. Kelly is the Chief People Officer at Crunchbase, and we have a lot to cover. So Kelly, welcome to the podcast. Um, I'd love to have you open. What do you want the audience to know about you? Oh goodness, wow, that sounds like an interview question. I am not being interviewed, right? So um, Where do you see yourself in five years? No, that's the worst <laughs> interview question ever. I'm not gonna I'm not gonna use that, but uh, yeah. Um I mean I am HR is my passion, right? I'm one of the few humans, lots of people have heard me say this, like one of the few humans who like chose this from the get-go. Most people end up in this profession, right? They like yeah. find their way into HR. I didn't. I like very deliberately and intentionally chose this. It's kind of all I know. Um, so I'm the least interesting person from that perspective because it is all I know, um, but like hyper passionate about this space. Why HR? Like why why was this uh, why was this a calling for you? It was really important for me to work. I always felt very drawn to business, but I also felt very drawn to making. You know, the majority of your life is spent at work, and most people discount that, right? So there's all sorts of like ways that people think about how they show up with their relationships at home and how they show up with their children and how they show up in different, but like no one really talks about work and and it's the where you spend the majority of your life. So might as well make it a good thing. I was particularly drawn to like labor relations, specifically like union relations. And I went to work um, for an organization that had a union. I wanted to kind of just understand that dynamic because it's taught to be a really negative dynamic. And I had some of my best experiences in what was absolutely not a negative dynamic. So, you know, it was important for me to be able to influence the most, the most significant part of someone's journey on this earth. Yeah. I mean, it's interesting. It is rare, but not uh, completely uncommon, right? Like I've, I've definitely had some guests who've kind of walked through their journey and, and some since childhood, right? And, and some who, it, you know, kind of HR ran in the family. It was like a family trait. So it's always interesting to kind of get that context. You know, your current role now, you're the chief people officer at Crunchbase. I know a lot of our audience is uh, kind of in the tech sector. You're likely familiar with Crunchbase, but some of you may not be. So let's kind of open up with just, can you give an overview of the business, the operations, and if you could kind of, you know, drill down uh, in addition to kind of what Crunchbase does, headcount, kind of org structure, and then uh, the structure of your people team to support that. Yeah, absolutely. So Crunchbase, for those that are not part of the 75 million um, who, uh, who uh, tend to hang out on Crunchbase, it's, you know, it's an AI power platform um, that helps deal makers discover um, and um, prioritize the right opportunities. And they do that using best in class, unique data. Um, so this is a lot of words for, we've got some really unique stuff about Crunchbase, a lot of unique data um, that exists within the platform and people use that to um, you know, make deals or make decisions about company data. So that's a, that's a summary of Crunchbase, but we're only a hundred and I think 70 employees now. It, they, they hire people on Tuesdays, so um, they may be slightly higher right now. <laughs> but um, it is about 170 employees. We are a fully remote, remote first organization. We have employees in 18 states um, and we have your typical tech company org, right? So we have a people function, a finance function, a product function, function, an eng function, and a rev function. And that is, um, and we, so it's a tiny, I would say it's a pretty small executive leadership team. There are six of us. And the HR team, like the people team underneath it is really, I have like a unique way of thinking about our people team, but let's say for simplicity's sake, we have an experience team, we have an ops team, and then we have a recruiting team. Why I say that we're a bit of a unique team in that is I believe in what I like to call spaghetti careers, uh, which we can talk a little bit more about that. But every quarter, my team, um, we all get together and we decide the objectives of the quarter and we create this thing called the People Project Pool. Um, and it is just like a, mishmash of projects 
and each of these projects has a owner or what we call a SPOA, a specific point of accountability. And then anybody else gets to swim in the pool. So while we are siloed in those functions, it is not uncommon to have a recruiter spend some time in the comp. And it's not uncommon to have a, you know someone in experience spend some time in recruiting. So it's everyone gets to swim in the pool. It's intended to give lots of flexibility to the way we design our team. And that's actually proven to be really valuable for Crunchbase because I want people who are equal part strategist and tacticians and can fly high and fly low all in a matter of a day. And I think that makes for a great and kind of always exciting HR work, people work. Yeah, well, I mean, we have to spend some more time on this. Yeah because I, I, I'm very intrigued by the concept and kind of how it came together. Walk me through the mechanics a bit more. So like obviously you have people that are in dedicated teams and dedicated role and they'll have a dedicated scope, I presume, of responsibilities based on what they do if they're in comp or if they're a recruiter or whatever it might be. And then they're able to you know, volunteer to opt in, maybe a better way to frame it, into some of these different kind of cross-functional teams and projects. How do you set that up? Is it is it almost like a like a percentage of your time is ideally focused on like the core function, and then a percentage of your time is on these different kind of SPOA driven initiatives? Or yeah. how do you think about that? I mean, your primary responsibility is always your functional area. However, you know there it's almost probably overprocessed at this point, but like we have very defined meeting cadences. So every project will get a project plan. Every project and it's run like you would run a project management plan right like it's every project gets a plan every project has a chart every project knows what meetings they are and then you are assigned tasks within within them where your primary responsibility should never suffer but it's all within the scope of helping the team so one of the things i love about it is that like everyone can jump in right um and it is really in almost interest focused which I love because yeah. someone who is on the experience team but has never really delved deeply into total rewards design, guess what? You're working on the open enrollment benefit project of the quarter. And that's I think that that's exciting. People tend to always find time for that work because it is exciting and it's always changing. The projects never tend to repeat. If they repeat, they repeat in like, new versions with which means you're tackling a different element or the project was too big to be done in one quarter so it becomes it takes on a life of its own yeah so what um the, the mechanics make sense what tech do you use to run it in terms of like designing the projects project managers stakeholder visibility uh, progress tracking and all that i would love to tell you that it was any sort of super fancy tech but we're creating <laughs> gan charts in sheets right so yeah we're using google now i will tell you the tech we do use to manage our OKRs is Lattice. So yep. we're using Lattice. So all of our projects show up in Lattice. <laughs> and every Monday, our team, I'm sorry, I don't know why it just gave me a thumbs up, but um, it's excited about it. Every Monday, our team has what we call the people team body double. So we body double for two hours as a team. We start every Monday morning this way, thinking they like it, but maybe they hate it and this will be their opportunity to tell me. Uh, we start our two hour, we have a two hour block every Monday, every every member of the people team. We review all of the projects. So the SPOAs are giving updates on their projects, both in written forms and lattice and then verbally. And then we just co-work together. Um, so the goal is you can stay, you can go, it's your journey. Most people stay, most people hang out. It's a really wonderful time to use breakouts. So that's our, that's kind of the method that we use within our team to manage the projects. Yeah, and I'm curious, like, are the quarterly initiatives fixed or fluid? And I guess the context is that is, you know, you probably, you go into a quarter, let's just say Q1, uh, you've gone over your strategic plan for the business, you're kind of developing your Q1 objectives for the people team, you know, based on that, March rolls around, oh, February, hopefully not March. And a, and a new thing happens, right? A new opportunity for the business, um, something that basically is gonna require kind of a task force within your team. Do you, do you kind of, because you're in short cycles with quarters, do you tee that up for the next quarter? Do you insert that in? If you insert that in, do you push something else back? Like how do you, how do you think about managing 
bandwidth uh, in scenarios like that. Yeah, there's always a prioritization game happening inside the house. I would say that you often probably more see that in these sort of like recruiting push. I have, I'm like, I'm privileged to be able to lead the best team in the world. And I've never ever seen our team say we can't. It's always how can we? And it's, that has been, that's not always been my experience, but this team specifically is always like, here are my sleeves, I will roll them up, let's go. There isn't a task too big or too small for any member of the team, myself included. It's let's go, I'll do it, I'll recruit, I will source, let's go. And I think that we've never seen our team say no. Now do some things get stalled on purpose? Do some things get deprioritized on purpose? Yes, absolutely that happens. It just happened with the project right now because other things needed to take priority. And we're having those conversations. We did, we do have like a defined people's strategy that we've been working for two plus years now. So my entire tenure, we've been working this strategy um, and it certainly pivots. We There, there are things that have changed. Um, there's entire technology that didn't exist when I joined the organization. And we, you know, it's it's work the plan, but always aligned to the overall and overarching business OKRs. Yeah. Well, and uh, yeah, I feel like we could spend the whole episode on this because I'm, I'm very intrigued, but I, I will limit myself to one more question. Uh, do you ever pull in people from outside of the people team on some of these sprints? Like are there opportunities for other employees in different areas of the business to say, hey, you know what, I'm actually, uh, I want to learn about this, or I have a unique perspective to bring to this, or you know, this initiative uh, significantly impacts my team and role. I would love to have a perspective. Like, are there, do you do you ever bring in kind of cross-functional support in some of these uh, projects? Yeah, all the time, actually. Um, it's not uncommon to have different. I'm not even sure they know they're on the team, but they show up on the team <laughs> meetings. Um, <laughs> So everything, right? Everything from, we also don't ever operate from, we don't operate from a position of like, we're gonna roll something out without inputs or opinions. Yeah. I think that's like recipe for HR disaster. So it's often times where we're gonna bring in different stakeholders at different elements I've on teams for the entire time, but they do sit on, sit on teams for different periods, be that marketing or content design if we're really focused heavily on a branding initiative or you know if we're really interested in redesigning a compensation structure it's really heavily focused on eng or right now we're redesigning our entire career ladders what does that look like well we we're not going to do that in a silo right we're going to be bringing in our stakeholders to have those yeah. conversations um, you know, one of the things that I'm also curious to get your perspective on, um, one of the things that uh, Crunchbase has done that I found pretty unique is having some flexibility around benefits yeah. and how you think about uh, allowing employees to kind of uh, opt in to the benefits that make sense for them. And I'd love to have you just expand a little bit more on like the philosophy there, um, what you found, how it kind of impacts the employee experience. Yeah, um, so it's the, the live your best life model, as I've called it. Um, we want our employees to live their best lives. And it's really, it's not all benefits, right? We have like a suite of very standard, traditional welfare benefits. You know, your medical, your dental, your vision. Now we have options within all of those and we try to maintain as much flexibility with all of that as possible. But specifically as it relates to our learning, budget and our wellness budget. So the philosophy behind that is I am not prescriptive. I am not here to prescribe what is best for someone. For instance, you know, team members of team members on my team that really, really enjoy golf. Let's just use, I'm not sure if anyone likes golf. I actually, I don't think anyone likes golf. That's no. not true. Um, so she, um, you know, like, let's just say a team member really loves golf. Like who am I to say that well-being for them and wellness for them doesn't include an afternoon on the golf course versus me who has five little humans that live in this house that call me mom running around all over the place what i need is an afternoon masseuse right so like that's what i need and it's a lot of times hr tends to be just extremely prescriptive with the way they yeah. think about benefits because and oftentimes, if like if you really like dig deeper, it's whatever is important to the HR person, right? Whatever is important to the person that's designing the benefit <laughs> is what you're generally going to see as the benefit that's offered. Right. And so, like, I just didn't want to be that way. So we just recently totally opened it up. Now it's just money in hand. Use it for whatever you want, and I don't need to know about it. There used to be like a bit of a receipt model, um, and I was like, no, just. just 
stop, like, just let them use it for whatever they wish. It's very much listed as a well-being line item on their paycheck, just so it's not just thought of as cash, but um, it is cash. <coughs> Bless you. Um, and Thank then you. the next way we think about this is with our learning and development budget. So a number of, you know, most organizations I've ever worked at have learning and development budgets, but they're like baked into the, the departmental budget. It's not the way it functions um, at Crunchbase. While we always have some money baked in for learning and development into departmental budgets, every employee at Crunchbase gets a $3,000 annual stipend for a learning and development of their choosing. While there is an approval process for that learning and development, it has to be like aligned. Like tomorrow I couldn't tell my boss that I want to become a yoga instructor and I think Crunchbase should pay for that. He'd probably direct me to my well-being funds that would cover that. As it relates to employees' journeys, as it relates to their learning, that is a really super flexible benefit. We've seen employees utilized for a lot of different things. Some of the most recent things we've seen it utilized for is conferences together, which I love because being a remote first organization, opportunities to like collaborate one-on-one, -on -one, you know, a few people together just at the same conference, I think is always really magical. I got an opportunity to do that with my two leaders on the people team this year, and it was a really wonderful time. Good. Yeah, and I think it's interesting. I imagine you'll have some pretty interesting stories uh, coming out of the employees in terms of like where they're using those wellness budgets. Uh, there was a company, it, uh, it no longer does this, so I'm not going to mention the company's name, but they had a similar approach around learning. And they wanted to create a culture of learning, and their view was, we really don't care what you learn. So you want to learn how to become a pilot. Yeah. That's learning. That's growth. You can use the budget towards that. And so it was really kind of unlimited. So the yoga instructor, I think, would be covered in that as well but i think you know, it was just it's just interesting because you're right i think our history in hr tends to be pretty prescriptive mm -hmm. um and tends to be pretty narrow too right a vision medical dental yeah. um you know i think now we're beginning to expand a bit more in terms of core benefits where we think about uh mental health you know and mm -hmm. fertility and financial wellness mm -hmm. um right but i think um you know it's interesting i think we still have a ways to go so i, I appreciate the approach you have around just giving that flexibility there's another kind of, uh, one of the other programs that uh, I've read about some of your approaches on that I found interesting and I'd love to learn more is just like how you think about diversity, equity, inclusion, and belonging within Crunchbase. And more specifically, how you look at it as something that is woven into the fabric of all of the people systems and the business. Yeah. And, and I think, you know, obviously we're kind of recording this in a moment in time where mm -hmm. the topic of DEI is certainly, certainly in tech mm -hmm. uh, is, is, you know, front and center uh, in SHRM. Yeah. front and center. Um, lots of questionable decisions and approaches that are happening. Um, but I think, again, your, your approach of really looking at it as something that is woven into the fabric of how you operate. It's not this additional thing or additional kind of function. Yeah. Uh, it's more of woven into the philosophy. To me, I, I agree. I think that is the way to approach this. I would love to just hear a bit more about, you know, how you thought about the design of this, how it actually kind of shows up in your people operating systems and more. Yeah, so, you know, I guess I have a lot of thoughts and opinions about this as does kind of everyone right now. But the reality is for us, it was there, we have an over our, an overarching well-being strategy. That's how we think about just general, the people, the people strategy in general is under this umbrella of overall well-being. And to me and to the, the business, that meant allowing every employee the opportunity to show up as their true authentic selves all the time and creating an environment that supported them. Now, with one caveat, I don't support hate, right? So we're never going to support any sort of hateful dialogues or unsafe conversations. But outside of that, we want our employees to feel like they can show up in whatever way, shape and form they wish to do that. Um, and that was, so it was, it was never that DEIB was not important to us. It's extremely important to us. And it shows up in lots of ways at Crunchbase through ERGs that are employee led through different, um, very specific Slack channels and communities that are employee led and employee monitored. But we really wanted to approach it more from you are safe here. This is a place where you can be fabulous and we're encouraging that and we want to support that. And we've had to support it. You know, there have been horrible things that have happened in our world where we've had to be very um, 
you know, very intentional about supporting specific populations of people. And we've always wanted to do that. So I've always thought that DE should never be this necessarily standalone function. I always thought it should be the way we, it was more of a philosophy of the way we are. Um, And we are, we want to be that for everyone because the reality is everyone comes with a different way of being. I'm curious, um, somewhat uh, related, but um, maybe expanded. Um, We're recording this in the uh, middle of an election year here in the United States. And there's a lot of conversation within businesses around how they should approach kind of quote unquote politics. And I'm using finger quotes Mm -hmm. for a reason because who defines what that is. But let's just be like very specific, like actual politics, the political system, the election process in the US. And, And I've seen different opinions on like, do we do we create spaces for that conversation within the workplace because that is uh, we want people to be able to show up fully and that is a part of their identity. I've seen obviously the other approach of like we're we're apolitical. We do not. This is not a place where we talk about politics, which I don't really know how that works, especially in an election cycle like this. But I'm curious, like, what is your both? I guess your and kind of the leadership team's yeah. philosophy around like how you plan on navigating the upcoming election. Yeah. You know, I support voting and that's probably, um, you know, so we we support voting and I think that that's how you show up for whatever political party you want to support. I, you know, I guess I will double down on, we allow our, we we want our employees to show up as their true authentic selves, but it can't get hateful. I don't care what side of the coin you're on. and who you're gonna vote for, you know, we encourage you to use, you know, that's one of the great things about this nation is you do, everyone that works in our organization um, that has the right, you know, has the right to vote, everyone should go and exercise that and express that. And that's the way our democracy runs. Now I will tell you, I've worked for organizations, I worked for a different organization during the last election and because things got so tense, we had to put dress codes in place. We had to put because because it just was getting it was getting dangerous yeah. for employees, and that's just that is such an uncomfortable thing to do. Fortunately, Crunchbase just very much stands for you know I guess be a good human, don't be hateful, have your opinions, and respect each other, um, and it's worked out well. But I been in spaces where it hasn't and people don't know how to um, necessarily behave in a non-hateful way and we've had to take measures. So it is, you do have to react, right? I don't know if I would opine definitively because I do believe it's culturally specific. Yeah. No, I think you're absolutely right. And I think it's, uh, people are looking to leadership to have a point of view. Not necessarily, I don't think their point of view, right? I think everybody is different, but I think it's where companies, I think the risk for companies right now is companies that aren't talking about this. Mm-hmm. They're not thinking about this at the leadership level. They're not kind of having some protocols and plans around like, again, like don't be hateful is a pretty great mm-hmm. operating methodology around all of these events. But, uh, you know, I think it's the companies that are, not, you know, just thinking that they don't need to do that. And that we may find ourselves in a position where it does get, you know, more toxic. And, and, and again, you're now having to deal with a potential powder keg, uh, in the workplace. And yeah. so, um, yeah, I think, uh, I think that's a smart approach. I, yeah, I, we do have a very strong, like we, we have a strong, um, VTO program at Crunchbase too, and we have amplified voting. Um, yeah. So we have amplified using your VTO hours. Every employee at Crunchbase is given 32 hours to volunteer a year and util- utilizing that to help the voting efforts. I do believe that that's really important. It's your opportunity to um, to cast your ballot for whatever you do believe. And, you know, my political beliefs aside, some of my best friends are, are not of the same political beliefs. And I do believe that you can have human conversations with people. Maybe some don't believe that these days, but I certainly still may maybe I'm in the minority of that, but believe that you can have conversations with people who have different political beliefs. Yeah, look, I mean, look, honestly, I think as an HR leader and practitioner, you you have to believe that, right? Like you have to believe that we can find common ground. And we're not always gonna, we're definitely not always gonna agree. We may not even understand, but I think, uh, you know, allowing again, setting hateful rhetoric aside, right? Mm -hmm. Zero tolerance for that. But in terms of just different perspectives, I think you've gotta be able to find ways to kind of, you know, uh, understand and, and at least be able to have kind of common disagreements yeah. and you know but but like civil uh, and I think that's what gets lost a bit I think at the, at the margins right on the kind of other side 
let's talk a bit about AI. Yeah. Like, I, I feel like, you know, we've got, you know, 20 plus minutes and it hasn't come up other than describing, uh, you know, Crunchbase's business. But I would love to get your perspective on, you know, obviously working for an AI powered company. Um, I'd love to get your perspective on just how, as a people leader, you think about leveraging AI kind of specifically within your, your people programs or your kind of operating rhythms and procedures. Yeah. I think that's such a really great question that um, you know I've heard I've heard it asked before, and I continue to like iterate on my thoughts on this because I see yeah. AI as such a powerful tool, but it's almost a space maker from my perspective from the people side. It makes space. It makes space for us to be able to do more of the in person, be it virtual in person, but like the more the bigger connection pieces that I actually think are so important on the people side. So when I think about the utilization of AI in any of the tech that exists, um, I actually did a crunch based search the other day for like HR tech with AI because I was just so curious. Like, I was like, how many are there? All like, of them came up. There. Like every yeah, one like, of them came, came up, up, right? It was yeah. crazy. None yeah. of them are in Greenville, South Carolina, which is where I live, which I thought was actually kind of funny. But um, it was, it's, I think there's so much tech out there and I think we should think about using so much of it. However, I, we have to be so careful and I'm not sure anyone's thinking about how we have to be so careful. We can never use AI to replace the human for some of the things that only a human should get involved in. The conversation I always go back to is um, I always want to know when someone changes their address. And while from an HR perspective, that's like the silliest thing, they're like, come on, let them go into the HRIS system, let them just type in their new address, like that's employee self-service. I was like, don't you want to know why? Don't you want to, don't you want to like make sure they're okay? Or like, you know, and I, I worry about over indexing towards technology and towards AI. Like I worry about the day where I have to type into a chat bot. How many bereavement days do I need for the, do I get for the death of my mom? Right? Like my mom is alive by the way. And she's going to hear that and be like, Kelly, what are you doing? But, um, like I think about that, like, you know, one day we're gonna have to put that into a chat bot and that's such a mistake that's such a mistake in my world so use it to you know to help you write emails use it to research use it to think about next practices use it to stretch your own thinking never use it for what is you know for that human connection that only a human can have you know, that is an opportunity to, you know, if there's a bereavement situation, that's an opportunity to empathize. That's an opportunity to be there and show up for an employee. You should do that. Um, the second a machine does that, we've lost. We've lost. So when I think about AI and I think about AI specifically in the people space, I think about using carefully, using, but using carefully and being very aware of where the line is to not cross. Yeah. I mean, when you think about, uh, and, and, that, and I appreciate that perspective, um, are there any particular use cases within your team um, that you found AI particularly helpful? And I think, you know, you're right. You, I'm glad you mentioned HR tech because, again, I joked like every HR tech is saying they're using AI yeah. because that's, they, you know, they have to and they don't have to, but they are. Anyway, side note, uh, you know, I think that there are, I'm, I'm always interested to learn about like specific use cases of how people teams are using them and I think in, in this context probably more of like maybe leveraging custom GPTs uh, you know or tools like that where they're kind of baking things uh, into their system yeah. and so in that context are, are there any are there any kind of interesting projects or things that you're doing with AI that you think others might benefit from yeah I um, actually just just created an entire list of like all companies that I'm like, ooh, this is interesting. I would be interested in that. Honestly, I think about compliance, right? Compliance is always one of those HR things that like just comes and beats you over the head all the time. Um, and we're at 18 states in the US. That's like, that's in some of these states, it's like being global. I always say I work in global HR because I have a California office. <laughs> But a lot of these states have a lot of laws and the, the compliance piece is really confusing. And I think about like leave laws, for instance, like how do you support your employees when they go on leave? We just partnered with a leave provider and they're utilizing AI left and right in how to. So that is it's taken the heavy lift off of our team to make sure that we're complying properly with this law and that law and this law. And it's just streamlining it through the AI. The human now has a lot more time to have 
exciting conversations with employees, helps them transition to maybe it's a new baby, maybe it's a fourth baby. That is that is the area where I see such magic. I, I've loved this, it's an AI startup. It's um, it's called Adora and I love it. And it's new, but it's, it's taking some of the annoying HR work away, um, making us compliant and giving us more time to have those conversations with employees. Yeah. Well, cool. Well, Kelly, I really enjoyed getting to know you a bit more, getting to know more about what you're building at Crunchbase, um, how you're approaching things. I appreciate you sharing your your journey and your work with us. Um, if any of our viewers, listeners want to connect with you after the show, is uh, LinkedIn the best way to do that? It is. It's a wonderful way to do it. Okay. Well, definitely uh, give Kelly a follow on LinkedIn. And uh, in the meantime... Yeah, I want to uh, let me know if you've ever done any write-ups on your HR kind of project teams, any blog posts or anything like that. I'd love to include those in the show notes of the episode. So if you if you have any of that, uh, please share it. If you don't have any of that, please create it because that's <laughs> actually a very interesting concept. I'd love to uh, I'd love to amplify. Awesome. All right. Well, thank you so much. I will. I have not written anything about it. I don't think I don't think anything's been written about it at this point. But yeah, it is a bit unique. It is a bit unique to our team. But thank you so much for having me on the show. It's been a pleasure and so much fun. All right. Thanks, Kelly. Enjoy the rest of your day. Thanks. You too.